Our whole life we're looking for something, aren't we, most of us? And I think a lot of the time we don't really know what it is. Uh, many people look for all kinds of things. You know, they look for relationships, they look for money, they look for fun, they look for you name it, <clears throat> fill in the blank. And what I've come to discover is that, oddly enough, sort of ironically, uh, that which we're looking for is really the very thing that's looking. It's this consciousness, this pure presence that we are on the deepest level is precisely what we're searching for. If you want to call it God, you could call it God. You don't have to call it anything. But it's right here, right now. It's here. What a relief. (laughs) And I'm not one of these people who says you don't need to do anything, it's just going to hit you one day. It's not very likely, actually. But the reality is it's here right now. And even as I say that, the the reality of that is so real to me. And I can feel that it's real to many of you as you hear those words. And I'd like to just share a little bit tonight um, about my own discovery of this reality. And to just talk in general a little bit about the nature of this discovery and what it means and maybe what it doesn't mean as well. I think so many of us have all kinds of high-flung ideas about enlightenment and awakening and all these things. And in reality, it's very simple, actually. We make it very complex and we have all kinds of expectations. But the reality of this pure consciousness, this holy presence that permeates everything that is, it's exquisitely simple. And for many years, for most of my life, I was seeking this presence very explicitly. I I was really sure very early on that it wasn't going to be found in money, that it wasn't going to be found in, in even other people, that it wasn't going to be found in any number of things that people feel it's going to be found in. Somehow intuitively I knew that it had to be found in what I called God, this holy mystery that it's always present, but somehow we overlook it. We don't see it. It's, it's maybe like one of those things that's so obvious that we don't see it. Have you ever been in a, uh, in a store, in a grocery store, looking for an article? I, I mentioned this in this book I wrote. Uh, how you can be in, a, in you know, you, you ask, well, where are the olives without pits <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the grocer says well they're in aisle 13 so you go to aisle 13 and you're searching aisle 13 and you're looking up and down aisle 13 you're looking <coughs> up and down and up and down and around and everywhere and you don't find the olives without pits you find the olives with pits but you don't find them without so you can't find what you're looking for so you run back and you ask the grocer again where, is, where are the olives with no pits she says, here, let me, let me show you. So she takes you there. She takes you right to the middle of the aisle. And she says, right there are the olives with no pits. And you see it as if for the first time. But you realize, oh, I must have looked at that a dozen times when I was walking up and down this aisle. But somehow I didn't see it. 
And, and life is like that. Sometimes the most obvious things we don't we don't see because we already have in our mind what it'll be like to see it. Mm-hmm. And so, even though it's always here, it's right in front of us. We make all these conditions, you know. Well, if I see it, that means the heavens have to open and the light comes down and, you know, the whole scenario. Many, All of us have our own little scenarios in our minds. But the reality of this presence is so intimate and so already one with who you are. For, for many years in my life, this sense of presence would come and seemingly come and go and come and go. And I'd given my whole life to finding it, so it was kind of frustrating. You know, I thought, God, I've given up everything. I've, you know, shaved my head. I've come to this place. I wear this dress. I get up in the middle of the night and sing pretty songs. And I do all these silly things, and I do it because I want to find you. Why can't I find you? I get little glimpses, but then you're gone. What's going on? And then one day in 2010 in Montreal, on March 25th, (laughs) at about 5.15 in the evening, um, I saw so clearly that this presence that I have been seeking is not separate from my presence. That my presence, here and now, that's always here and now, have you ever not been present? No, you're always present. And it was like finding the olives without the pits. I just, in that split second, I saw so clearly that it had always been there. It had never not been there. And the only wonder for me was how I had not seen it before. How could I not have seen this? How could I not have known this? It's so obvious. You know? It's like discovering you have a head. (laughs) Wow, I have a head. How wonderful. (laughs) But often, in the whole non-dual spiritual circus, <laughs> um, many people have this idea that discovering this divinity within somehow obliterates humanity. Mm-hmm. That, that humanity and divinity are somehow mutually exclusive realities or that or even that one is real and one is not real but I've almost got to a point where I'm, I'm really not happy with the word enlightenment because I think it, it there's so much baggage with that word people hear enlightenment and they automatically many of them think of this sort of um, sort of neutralized (laughs) non-person that has no human emotions, Mm -hmm. no human juice, that's just kind of denied humanity for the sake of divinity. But one of the things I love about the whole Christian mystical tradition and and the kind of pointing of the Christian mystery is that it talks about Jesus being fully human and fully divine. It's a beautiful phrase even. Fully human, fully divine. So it's not saying he's 50% human and 50% divine. It's saying he's 100% human and 100% divine. So what does that really mean? And is that only true about Jesus? 
you know, traditional Christianity has often sort of presented it that way, hasn't it? That that's true for Jesus. But what I saw in that church that day on 2010 in Montreal on March 25th at 5.15 was in the third from the left choir stall at l'église de Saint-Sacrement on mont Royal was that that presence that filled Christ that was Christ fills me and is me and is you and is all of us And as I said, sometimes there's a misunderstanding that, that the realization of that divinity, of that vast, spacious consciousness, that awareness in which everything that appears appears and in which everything that disappears disappears, that it obliterates all those things appearing and disappearing. That it annihilates them, including the human person. But I think that's not, that's a misunderstanding, at least in my experience. The word that I've come to feel lately is maybe points more accurately than enlightenment or awakening. Those are still good words, I'm not throwing them out. But I like the word transcendence. And the reason I like it is because. Transcendence means that you go beyond. Trans, beyond. You ascend beyond something. You know, most of us go through our lives, we're born to a particular pair of parents, we're raised in a particular way, we go to school. We learn various things. We have our own culture, our gender, our roles, our relationships, all these things. And we go through life and we have this idea, yes, this is who I am. I'm Francis Bennett. I was born on this year. I had this mother. I had this father. I went to this school. I had these experiences. I became a monk. I did this. I did that. I didn't do this and I didn't do that. And so on. And we think that's who we are exclusively. We think, that's all that I am. I'm, I'm the sum total of all these experiences, of all these sort of roles and relationships and functions. We think that's who we are exclusively. There's nothing more. And then, if we're lucky and have a certain grace that we all actually have, we wake up to this presence like I did that day. We wake up and we see this all-pervading, ever-present presence is who I am on the very deepest level. It's the essence of who I am. It's the core of who I am. And it's never, ever changed. That presence has always been eternally present. And it always will be. And it always is now and here present. All the other things about me, my birth, my life, my relationships, my roles, my physical body, my gender, everything, none of it's permanent. It comes and it goes, but the presence remains. So some people, when they get a little glimpse of that presence, and especially if it's just a glimpse, because you get a glimpse and then something goes away, And what do you do? You tend to want to get it back. And you tend to start forming all kinds of ideas about it in your head. 
okay, so I, I remember the way it was, so that must mean it's like this, and that must mean it's like that, and that must mean A, B, and C is true of it, but X, Y, and Z is not true about it. And so you get all these ideas and beliefs and concepts about it, and then you hold on to those, because that's all you got. Because the experience came and went, and you want it to stay, so you hold on to it in any way you can. But the reality of it is that it lets you know in a very direct and wonderful way that you're not merely this body, you're not merely this person with a name and a form and a function and a role and a relationship, many relationships. But that you're also this unchanging presence. That in fact, that's who you are on the, on the absolute level. That's who you are ultimately. Because that's the one aspect of who you are that never changes. And for a while, I mean, when I first had this realization hit me so strongly, four or so years ago, I literally sat in my room for four or five months and barely said a word. Because everything I thought that I was suddenly seemed to fall away. And all there was was this scintillating, shimmering, wonderful presence. And that seemed to just fill the whole world. And everything else paled in comparison to it. But then eventually... What I came to see was that even this person, this Francis, with all these roles and relationships and so on that I mentioned, that even that was included in this. Because this this consciousness, this pure, vast, infinite openness, if you want to call it that, is so vast and so big, infinitely vast, that it contains absolutely everything. Everything that appears and disappears, appears and disappears in that. Including this person. So we transcend humanity into divinity. But transcendence does not mean obliteration. It means going beyond. So it's a realization that I'm not merely this body... I'm not confined to this human person. There's much more to who I am than that. But that is still included. And in fact, when someone awakens to this vast openness, it's so, by its very nature, unconditionally open, that there's no aspect of this human person that isn't embraced fully. So not only are you still human, you're more human. You're more in touch with your humanity in all its aspects. In some of the aspects that we think of as pleasant and some of them that we think of as unpleasant. Because the very nature of this vast, pure consciousness is that it includes absolutely everything in unconditional openness and it excludes absolutely nothing. That's why people say God is love because this reality that I'm pointing to with these very poor words is what some people would call and what I call, I have no trouble calling it God. And what is love? Love is this vast, unconditional openness. So one way of talking about it is to say it's love. So you could say you are love. You yourself, in your essence, in your core, are essentially love itself. 
the one big, big thing that everybody is looking for. And how odd that that which we look for is what we already are. But again, I don't want to be misunderstood. This does not mean that we don't do anything. You hear that a lot. Don't do anything. There's nothing you can do. There's no one to do it. Blah, 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 blah. Well, that maybe works as a logical kind of conclusion. If you say, well, you are already what you're seeking, so therefore you don't have to do anything to find it because you're already that. But you know, an example just came to me this morning that I actually posted on Facebook was... If you're holding a, a, the most beautiful diamond, the most beautiful, flawless diamond in your hand, and it's covered and caked and congealed in mud, well, you've got what you want. You've got the beautiful diamond. But does that mean there's nothing to do? Not exactly, huh? It's like, yeah, the beautiful diamond's right in the palm of your hand, but how much can you really enjoy it? if it's covered in mud. It's not going to look much like a beautiful diamond, is it? So even though you already have what you're looking for, and you can't acquire it, there's nothing new you can add to get it. You don't have to go in search of some other diamond. You've already got the the Pope diamond, the most beautiful, flawless diamond in the world, in the palm of your hand. But you can't really enjoy it because it's completely covered in mud. So the whole spiritual journey is not about acquiring something. That's correct. When people say there's nothing to do, there's nothing to attain, on an absolute level, yes, that's correct. You already are that, so there's nothing that you need to acquire or add to yourself. So the spiritual journey is not a matter of adding something new, but it is a matter of letting go, washing off something old in order to reveal what's always been there. And there are ways of doing that. There are cleaning solutions, so to say, that you can use to wash the diamond. I'm telling from Ohio, wash. And I feel like my job, because I found out what those things are, is to tell people. And so that's what I do. I just go around telling people how to wash their diamonds. <laughs> And the funny thing is, it's really one diamond. Mm -hmm. It's the same diamond Mm -hmm. in all of our palms of our hands. So there's nothing to do, and there's a lot to do. You already are that. And in another way, that's not being manifested necessarily. So how do we manifest it? How do we clean the diamond? How do we clean the mud off the diamond? And I would say the first sort of age-old cleaning solution that's been used by every saint and sage of every religion and tradition known to humankind since almost the beginning of time has been some kind of contemplative practice, some kind of turning within and recognizing the diamond within and there's various ways to do that there's various techniques there's various sort of practices of meditation for me the best way for me was contemplative prayer 
of really looking in faith at first at this presence in my own heart. I called it God. You don't have to call it God. And as I said, it's not separate from your own simple presence here and now. So it's extremely accessible. Because you're already present. You're present in this room. You're hearing somebody speak. You're seeing things, perhaps, if you have your eyes open. And what is it that's hearing? What is it that's speaking? What is it that is seeing and touching and feeling? Just pure sentience, pure consciousness. Just that which knows whatever's appearing, whatever's disappearing. It's like that that little jar of olives. It's so obvious that we miss it. Or some people have used the, the analogy of the movie screen. We're watching a movie, and we're so engrossed in what's appearing on the screen that we miss the screen. We miss the substratum that's always been there, that without which we couldn't even see a movie, and yet we ignore it. And God's like that. God's the substratum that's always been here, always will be here, always is eternally here now. That which knows, that which is aware, that which sees, hears, tastes, touches, in you and in me. So the essence of contemplative practice is just turning that awareness back in on itself, you could say. So like awareness looking at awareness. Consciousness being conscious of itself. And that's really what awakening is, is when consciousness becomes totally conscious of itself and then never loses the consciousness. That is enlightenment, what we call enlightenment. It's very simple, but not easy. So sharing about that is my reason for being on the planet. (laughs) I'm pretty sure. (laughs) And sharing about that is not just about getting up in front of people and talking about it. Sharing that is living that. Abiding in that presence. Being that presence elicits the presence in others. Because the very nature of this present presence is that it's self-shining. It shines. Just like the sun. The sun doesn't have to decide to shine. Well, it's Monday morning. Should I get up and shine? You know, no. Its very nature is that it just shines, it radiates. And it's so shiny that even in people who are not consciously aware of it, it shines. For me it shines. I see it everywhere in everybody. I just look over this crowd and it's just shining, 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 shining. Thomas Merton, a monk of the community that I was in, has this really famous passage in the sign of Jonah, I believe it is. He talks about being at the corner of Sycamore and Elm, I think, in Louisville. And he says, he was looking at the people on the streets, and he says, how do you you tell somebody that they're walking around shining like the sun? (laughs) And after this happened to me, I remember being on the metro in, in, um, not Paris, in Montreal, and going into this metro, and I was so struck by this consciousness just shining in all these people, in stray cats and dogs and everything. You know, everything, everywhere I looked, 
And sometimes I'd sit there on the metro right after this happened. I'd be going to my place where I did parish work, where I did pastoral work. And I'd be sitting on the metro crying like a baby because all I could see is this vast ocean of suns (laughs) shining. So in one sense, what a person says about all this is really secondary. You know, I mean, I write. I wrote a book. I'm writing another book now. I write on Facebook all the time. I am, I'm just write. I write every day. But if I were not abiding in this sense of presence, I could write till I'm blue in the face and none of it would touch anybody. It might even be the same words. It would be, it would maybe be correct words or whatever. But there's this presence beneath the words. There's this presence that the words flow out of. And that's what matters. That's what transmits this reality, this consciousness. The words are just secondary. And the reason that people can get a transmission of this consciousness through those who abide in it is because the consciousness is in them. It's resonating from here to there. It's, and, and, and then you realize there's not even a here or a there. This presence just permeates all of us, all the time. So the presence in you sees the presence in me and it, it loves itself. That's why many of us have a love for people like Jesus, the Buddha, saints, people that we admire that seem to radiate this presence, is because they are mirrors of us. We see our true selves in them, just like you look in a mirror and see your body looking back. So we're all called to be these mirrors, mirrors of the divine. Mirrors for God to see God's self. And that's what's so kind of amazing about this. Is that the the whole world is this place where God just enjoys seeing God's self. Or loving God's self. Does that make sense? It's kind of weird. (laughs) So, so I've talked some, but why don't we just sit for a minute in, in this presence that's already, already fully present. So let's just enjoy it. Enjoy ourselves in, in, in a presence, in presence, together. So if you feel comfortable, just close your eyes. You know what, I'm going to try something here. First, open your eyes again. (laughs) Look around the room. Just look around the room and see what you see. See who you see. So do you feel the sense of this sentience that's looking through your eyes right now? Isn't there some kind of, there's like a cognizance, there's a presence that's present to the experience of seeing, isn't there? There's an awareness of seeing and hearing right now that's happening in you, isn't there? Can you feel that? It's not, it's not don't make it into some special thing. It's just, <laughs> it's just awareness of, of seeing. Let's just look at seeing for now. It's awareness of seeing. Whatever it is you're seeing. If you're looking at me, you're seeing this person move their hands and talk. And you know, there's a, there's a, there's a sentience that's hearing the little bird twittering. Okay, now 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 close your eyes. 
if you feel comfortable doing that. And guess what? You're not seeing now. You're just seeing your eyelids closed over your eyes. Whatever that looks like. But that which was seen through your eyes a second ago is still here, isn't it? It's still present. Look at that. See that. Know that. Just feel it. That sense of being here right now, that sense of sentience that was seen through your eyes just less than a minute ago hasn't gone anywhere. It's not seeing now. It's just hearing. It's feeling. But it's still here, isn't it? Even though it's not seen. So that's a little kind of access card to it that hope points for some of you. So let's just rest silently in that for a few minutes. You're so used to focusing on the movie that you don't notice the screen. But I'm asking you right now to notice the screen. Not even primarily notice the sensory experience of the bird twittering, people noises, chair noises. And it's not easy at first, but turn your attention to attention. Turn your awareness on awareness. And just rest there. Rest in that. Just be present to your own presence. Okay, slowly, when you feel ready, open your eyes again. And that presence is now looking through your eyes again. Anything that comes and goes in your experience, this presence is present to it. And you can, you can come to see that Always. You can come to rest in that always. It's just the simple gift of being, of existing. It's so simple. It's not esoteric or weird. It's just what's always here. And yet, like the diamond, it's always here. But you need to clean the mud off. So, as I just look around the room and feel you, I can feel that many of you have some sense of what I'm talking about. You've seen it on some level. And you're hungry. Mm-hmm. 
So God has brought you to this place tonight. And maybe you have a concern or a question or an observation. So if you feel comfortable enough, if you feel that you're among friends, I think you are. So if you'd like, why don't you ask your question or make your comment? It might be wonderful. (laughs) Not only for you, but maybe for someone else. They might have the same question, same concern. There's one right over. When we closed (coughs) closed our eyes, um, this became not visible, the the, uh, outside world. But what became visible on the inner screen, uh, thoughts projected on the screen and images (coughs) that result in feelings. And uh, how do you hold it? How do you... How do you how do you uh, transcend those? Transcend those. It's not easy. We spend a, a whole lifetime, at least one. I think probably more. Um, paying attention to all those things, primarily thoughts, ideas, sensations, experiences, feelings, emotions, all these things. And there's nothing wrong with any of those things. But this consciousness that I'm pointing to is that which knows them. You know when they have this uh, term about God, that God's omniscient? That means knowing all. My sense is that's what that means, that God is the consciousness that knows all. That everything that is, everything that appears, everything that disappears, God or pure consciousness or presence knows it. It's that which knows. And it's already at the very core of your being. But we're so accustomed to ignoring it that when somebody asks us to just be conscious of this that's always present, it seems very difficult. So what I mean, do it, in other words, just, just be... Just be a, 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 that's what happens. And thoughts are projected on an invisible screen and just allow that to be without making a judgment on it. Just that's what, that's what is right now. Just like I'm looking out, I see trees. That's what is right now. So but what happens is when these thoughts occur... And depending on the, the quality of the thought, there's a judgment about it. Oh, not that thought again. Oh, like that. So, how, how is it... How do you know there's a thought? How do I know there's a thought? Yeah. Because I perceive it. It's a, it's a, ah, how do you know there's a judgment about the thought? Because I perceive that as well. Who perceives it? The perceiver. What's that? I don't know. <laughs> but you know, it's obvious, isn't it? That there's, there's something that knows. There's, there's always something present that knows, isn't there? Is there ever, is that ever not present? No. No. So that's, it's so easy, it's hard. It's so obvious that it's obscure. But that's essentially what contemplative practice is, no matter whatever stripe you give it or whatever name you call it. Self-inquiry, contemplative prayer, uh, mindfulness. It's like wanting to take ownership of it. Like when you say who is perceiving. It's like I want to say me, but I can't find me. How does I search that I can how to find me? Mm. But that's what I that's how that's how I get this identity called me. Well, but that's already your that's like I know, I know. Pious wool gathering. Uh, Philosophy. 
But you know what? It, this consciousness, this presence, this awareness, it couldn't be more simple. It's like we don't need to do all that. We don't need to, oh, I, can't, I look and I can't find a me, and there's no me, and there's, so there's no one here to do this, and blah, blah. We get so complicated, and we get all this Neo-Advaita crapola you know, <laughs> just circling in our heads. And really, all it is is this sentience right here, right now, that's hearing these words, that's seeing what you're seeing. It's just so totally obvious, but we just miss it. And spiritual practice is just noticing it, just taking a moment and looking at it. And it's just like the olives on that on aisle 13. If you look long enough, you'll eventually see it. And you'll know that you know that you know that there it is. And that's awakening. That's, it's that simple. As I say, simple, not easy. And, I, and I'm not trying to minimize the, 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 the difficulty factor. It's going against eons and layer after layer of conditioned ways of looking at reality. So, so what is that stands in the way of accepting that as a truth, as a truism? What, what's, what stands? What would be the thing that stands in the way of that accepting? Of just that that's what it is. Just these complicated minds that we have that just try to understand it all, make theories about it, make esoteric doctrines about it. To, you know, I mean, and there's nothing wrong with all that on one level, but what I'm pointing to is much more immediate and much more living and, and real. And it's not theoretical at all. It's just so absolutely existential and ontological on the level of being itself. That's what ontology is, the the study of being, ontological. It's on that level of being. It's just who you are right now in your very being and who you've always been. And if we turn our attention on that and rest in that, Enough. That's one perspective. That's one way of coming to this. That's not the only way. That's one way. You know, what I do with people when I teach people, what I, how I work with people is, I have three, a three-way approach. It's like if there was a mountain, I've said before. If there's a mountain, and you look at the mountain from one side of the mountain, you get one side of the mountain, don't you? But if you travel around to the other side and look at it, you'll get another view of the mountain. And if you go to the side, you'll get another view of the mountain. So I figure if you get three views of the mountain, then you get a more comprehensive view. So the first view is this contemplative practice. Looking at looking. Being aware of awareness itself. Being present to presence. And and then what you discover eventually is presence is always self-present. It's always present to itself. It's the very nature of presence. To be present, right? And what's it's, it's primarily present to? Presence. All the things that come and go, come and go. But presence remains. Does anybody else have anything? Yeah? I notice you're not using the term ego. Thank you. It, it, it would seem that all of this that gets in the way is is the ego. And I'm wondering. I'm very decidedly not using the term ego because I think ego is overused. And ego now in the whole non-dual neo Advaita, whatever it is, is is become this boogeyman. Like ego is the one big bad boogeyman that we all hate. It's like the little devil on our shoulder or something, you know. And I think that's just ridiculous, actually. The reality is that there is no ego, really. I mean, ego is a concept about who we are. So there's, like, everybody talks about killing ego. Well, you know, it's like that old analogy about the snake and the rope, you know. 
if you go into your, I, in the book I modernize this, if you go into your garage and there's a, a big rope coiled up in the corner that you use on your boat in the summer or something. So you coil it up and put it in your corner during the winter months. And then when, you, when it's time to get the boat out again, you, that's, my dad used to do that. So that's why it comes to mind. Uh, you know, you take it out of the garage, you put it back on your boat, wherever your boat's stocked, and you, and you use the rope. But if you come into the garage in the middle of winter and it's dark, you got home late, and you see that rope over in the corner, and you think, oh, my God, it's a snake. It's a big, huge snake. Now, why you'd think there'd be a big, huge snake in your garage, I don't know. But maybe you live in, maybe you live in Florida or North South Carolina where I used to live where there's lots of snakes. So you see this and you think it's a snake. Well, what, what should you do? Should you kill the snake? You turn the light on. <laughs> yeah. The snake's not really that big of a threat, is it? Because guess what? It's not a snake. It's a rope. So these roles, the, this form, <coughs> this personality, you know, I mean, something really radical happened to me, but I'll tell you right now, there's still a personality here. <laughs> You know, and it can be probably a pain sometimes to some people, I suppose. But he's not such a bad guy. I mean, I've learned to live with him. And it's fine. Like, I know that I know that I know that that's not ultimately who I am. But that little personality that happens to like, uh, you know, anchovies on pizza, that likes vanilla ice cream rather than strawberry that likes to run, that, uh, you know, uh, likes to play guitar, whatever. It's fine. It's not, not a problem. It's not who I am on any ultimate level, but I don't need to, like, hit it over the head and kill it, you know, either. So, and as far as the, the, the negative ego, the ego that, like, does all this bad stuff, you know, tempts us like the devil on our shoulder. That's just a mistaken idea about how to be happy. That's all that is. It's an idea. Oh, if I rob that bank, I'll be really happy. Maybe I should. If I have 35 beautiful students become my courtesans, I'll be happy. That's not an idea of mine, by the way. but uh, It's just the most outrageous thing I could think of. So... You know, what is that? Is that an entity? No, it's just a mistaken idea. It's a concept. It's just a... So the ego, big bad ego thing is just... Yeah, I don't go there a lot. I don't use that word because it's it's like Jack Frost or the Easter Bunny or, you know? Okay, what about Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit and ego, that's a different kind of... I know. I mean, uh, I'm just wondering if you use that term. I do, actually. You know, I've decided recently something. I'm, I'm just like a public announcement. I'll have you know. But I, 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 I've decided um, recently, I was back at my old monastery, Gethsemane, praying at the spot that I prayed at when I was 18 and felt called to the monastery. And what came to me was you need to start a group. You need to start a little group that uses Jesus as a model of awakening, that sings Christian songs, that has Christian, Judeo-Christian imagery and symbol and archetype. Because I live in a Western country where people are usually Christians or Jews of some kind, or even if they're not, they've been exposed to that tradition. And those images and symbols and things point to this reality just as good as any other images and symbols. You don't have to use them if you don't want to, but I like them. I mean, I was raised in that. I don't have any beef with Jesus. I like Jesus. (laughs) Yeah, Jesus is just all right with me. And in fact, the symbol for me, somebody asked me at dinner, the symbol for me that best embodies this in my heart, this presence, is Christ, is the Christ consciousness. Like what I experience, how I would put it into words in, for my experience, is that 
It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. That I feel this Christ consciousness, this Christ reality, is what lives my life now through this form. So I don't feel one bit of separation from that Christ reality. That's who I am in my essence. Now, it's, it's shined through this particular form. And uh, an example I've done, used with that a lot is stained glass windows. You know, you've got stained glass windows that all reflect the same sun. But they all do it in this wonderfully unique and awesome way, don't they? You know, they each have their own facets, their own colors, their own scenes they're depicting. But it's the same sun that makes them beautiful. Without the sun, do you ever go into a church and look at stained glass at night? Not very exciting. It just looks like dark hunks of glass. But the sun shines through it, and it's gorgeous and beautiful. And each one is unique. So that's the glory of the human humanness. Because the, the divine sun shines through each human life in this room in an absolutely unique way that's never, ever been seen before and will never, ever be seen again. How wonderful is that? How glorious is that? The glory of God shining through each human life window and that's when we discover who we really are this ego you know that's who we think we are that's all the ego is just who we think we are and who we are has nothing to do with what we think (laughs) not really I mean there's there's aspects of who we are on the relative level that like I say it's fine you don't need to obliterate it or anything. It's fine. Just let it be. You know. Does that sort of respond to your... Sort of. Sort, sort of. of. <laughs> yeah. Yeah? Um, most people are probably familiar with, um, in sports, the training technique of using visualization. And... Um, in my experience, uh, doing that has always been difficult for me. I can't really see myself do, for doing something, performing something. And so when I would use visualization exercises, it was much more relevant and, and uh, valuable for me to viscerally imagine the experience of my body, what my body feels like when I would be doing a particular movement. And when you were explain when you were saying be aware of the awareness, it's kind of like doing the visualization thing. It's hard for me to relate to. Yeah. You know, it's the kind of thing that makes me scratch my head. And when I think of so having you know, trying to to dwell in that concept is, you know, really It's not a concept. Yeah, it, well, it doesn't seem productive for me. For me, <coughs> like if I'm meditating, when I feel presence most pervasive and deeply is when I just, uh, you know, are able to let go of thoughts as much as it's possible. Yeah. And really just feel like I'm a blank field with whatever um, stimuli come in. You know, yeah. The sounds, and, and I'm, it's just registering, and it's just like this data coming in to the computer, but there's no reaction. It's, it's just being there. Yeah. So do people, I mean, people learn everything. A little bit differently. Yeah, sure. So people learn this differently when they, you know, to have those aha movements. Sure. Um, they need. It, 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 so is it? I guess what I'm asking is it. Is it is it preferable for people to focus on one um, technique or? Um, no, everybody's you know? different. Every like you say, everybody's going to learn things differently. And if that sounds like what you're doing works for you, then do it. You know, I'm, I'm, the only reason I did that thing with the eyes is because I found that some people resonate with that. Some people kind of have a sense. They can immediately get a sense of there's this consciousness looking through these eyes right now. And then when you close the eyes and say, okay, is the consciousness still present? They can see what you mean then. They can kind of get, yeah, there's this consciousness that's always present. 
and they can access it. But you're absolutely right. It's very counterintuitive for most folks because they don't generally do that. They don't generally pay any attention to that consciousness at all. They use it to be aware of all these things and stuff, and, but they don't pay any attention to the consciousness itself. It's like the screen. It's not the important thing, they don't think. But that's the, see, that's the kicker. It's the most important thing. It's God, for God's sake. <laughs> you know, it's the infinite awareness and presence that permeates everything that is. How much more important could something be? And, but, but we ignore it. We just do. So I think if you're, what, you, what you described about just trying to keep a blank slate and just be aware of whatever arises and it hits it and it doesn't judge, it's just aware. Because awareness doesn't like or dislike anything. It's just aware of it, isn't it? In fact, well, you could say in a certain sense, you could say that it's love, that it embraces it in love because it's absolutely unconditionally open. I actually prefer that than say it doesn't like or dislike because that has the more that has the kind of juiciness and warmth to it that the realization of this has. I mean, just talk to people or be around people who are realized in this way, and you'll feel warmth. You won't feel this dry, analytical. I don't like or dislike. I'm just blah blah blah. You know, this kind of. That's just not it. That that's a, like a head thing. But the reality of this is this warmth, this openness, this un, like just think of that unconditional openness. It has a kind of embracing that it embraces everything that it. It doesn't just allow it, it doesn't just tolerate it. It almost celebrates it. If it is, it's like it just celebrates it because it is. And that's you know that scripture in, in Genesis says. And God, cre- and, and God created this and God created that. And then at the end when God cre- created all this, said, and God looked and said, it is good. That's the spirit of this. It's, it is, it's wonderful. Whatever it is, it's, just, it, it's embraced because it is. Because right now, it's what is. It might be unpleasant. It might be painful. Yes, sure. But it is. Yeah. So when you're talking about awareness, watching awareness, it's like for years that eluded me what that meant, like looking back at what you're looking out at. Yeah, it's it's tricky. And when I finally got it, I didn't know it. I felt it. Yeah. It's like a visceral thing in my body. Exactly. But it's it still feels like relationship. It still feels like other. It's, it's almost like I'm in love with it. With, and so I'm wondering, is, is awakening that realization that there's no relationship, that I am that? Does that, does that illusion have to break down? That there's, there's something here? Some illusions are fun. <laughs> Some illusions are nice. And I think... They, even Shankara talks about father of Advaita, Vedanta, talks about um, um, keeping a certain duality for the sake of devotion. Mm. That you know, devotion needs a kind of duality, doesn't it? Like if you have the lover and the beloved, there's a duality there. But it's like a play, you know. It's like a, a game of hide and seek. Mm. You know, okay, I'm going to hide now. 10, 20, 30, 40, whatever you count, and then the other person looks for the... It's like a game. And it's like God wants to play that game in this play that we're in. And it's like God wants to hide from himself and then find himself. And then you get to, you know... I mean, it's like when people, when lovers, you know, get into fights. And some people actually, I, I know I, I have a lot of Italian relatives. Because my, my mom's sisters were all Irish, but then they married all these Italians. So you got all these Irish-Italian people, so they fight a lot, you know. And, uh, so, and, and I remember my one aunt saying, oh, I love when we get into fights because then we get to make up. Mm. You know, we get into these big fights and then we get to make up and tell each other how much we love each other and show each other how much we love each other. I guess it doesn't do it any good to tell God I'm tired of playing around. <laughs> Try it. I know. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, there is a realization that comes that there is no separation. And that's what came to me was that this presence of God that I've been seeking, that I thought was out there somewhere and came and visited me and then went away on vacation and then came back and then went away. It was like this fickle lover that would never kind of give you the goods, you know. <laughs> and, and yet there came a sense eventually that that presence that I've been seeking is this presence right here and right now. And yet, that's intellectual for me. For, for you, was it intellectual for a while? Like I knew that, but then I knew it. No, it's not intellectual at all. Not it's now. totally real. Right. But prior to March 25th. March 25th. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I would have. If you said, do I believe God is present in me? I would have said yes, but I didn't have a direct experience of it. But, and there's world of difference between saying I believe something and experiencing it directly. You know, but there does come that sense of oneness, of unity, of complete oneness, wholeness, not two. You know, but then you can go back into the game of two-ness just for the fun of it. Why not? That you know, that's the thing with this whole non-duality scene. It's like, oh, it's non-dual, 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 non-dual. It's like, hey, non-duality is big enough to hold duality. The, the most authentic and profound non-dual app, non-duality includes duality. Because if you've got non-duality and duality, what do you got? <laughs> Count them too. Duality, not duality. Absolute, relative. Real, unreal. You know, that's mostly the non-duality game is very dual. Because <laughs> it excludes everything that's not dual. That's not non-dual. Including words. Do you ever get those jokers? These people that, you know, they, they only talk in non-dual language. Oh my God, it's so annoying. Oh. And they and you can't say anything. If you say something, they jump on you. Well, you said others. You want to go, yeah, what's your point? <laughs> I mean, on one level, there are others. On another level, on another level, no, there are no others. But it's fun to have others sometimes, you know? You know, who are you going to have a party with if there's no other? <laughs> Yourself? You know? It's just a game. It's just a play. It's like when you're in a play. You know? I was in gobs of plays, like in high school and college. I was a real, you know, I was really the actor. I was in every play under the sun. And, um... <clears throat> And plays are fun, but you don't get up on the stage when you're in a play and start telling the audience, well, I'm not really this character. I'm, I, you know, and this is not really my wife. And, um, and you're not really in outer Siberia right now, just in case you didn't know. You know. Well, you go, get off the stage, you're ruining the whole play. You know, this is a play. There are apparently... A lot of people in this room. And they each have their own beautiful face. And they each have their own beautiful name. And their own beautiful story. And why not enjoy it? Why have to, I'm not saying you're doing this. I'm just, you got me, you set me off. <laughs> this whole, this whole non-dual thing is, is griping my gizzard. Like, like, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of over it. Somebody, asked, I was on a thing the other day, and they said, "Was Jesus a non-dual teacher?" That was the thing. And, and like on one level, I could say, "Yeah, Jesus was a non-dual." But then I, I, I said to her at one point, "I said, I'm not so sure I'm a non-dual teacher. You know, I'm not so sure I'm a teacher. I'm not so sure about a lot of things." But you know, what I'm saying is, this reality is so all-inclusive that nothing is excluded. So when you get people talking about being realized and they're excluding half of what's appearing, well, that ain't it, folks. I mean, you know, if there's all this exclusion going on, then there's something kind of off in that insight, that understanding. At least, let's say, at least it's not complete. Let's say that. You know, it might be okay as a stage, 
We all go through, like even when you're growing up, you know, you go through stages, don't you? You know, do you remember when you're a little kid and you try to pretend like you're a grown up? And you and you and do you ever see these little girls with their mom's dresses and shoes on and stuff and they're they look a little funny, don't they? They're walking around with all this stuff that doesn't really fit them, and they're trying to act grown up and they put makeup on usually not very well, and they're playing dress up and they're they're pretending to be grown. And that's the way a lot of this non dual stuff is. It's people pretending to be, you know, something. And it's, it's, it's cute. It's like, okay, that's cute. But it's not, you know, it's not the final frontier, you know. So when we get all hung up about this duality thing, it's like, you know, there is non-duality to be realized. And it, there is a reality there. But there's also a validity to duality. Otherwise, no one would ever get married, would they? And then where would we be? You know, population would go. Well, maybe not. <laughs> but no one would even get together to have children if they if they just if everybody was just sitting in a cave looking at the wall and just blissing out in the oneness of everything. Not much would go on on the human scene. So it's like being in a play. You play your part, you do your thing, but you realize on some level I'm not really this person in the play. That's not who I really am on the deepest level, but right now it's the role I'm playing, and I'm going to enjoy it, and I'm going to do a good job. I'm going to learn all my lines, learn all my cues, learn all my songs, and do the play, you know? And, like, relax a bit. It doesn't have to be all so, you know what I mean? (laughs) Some people get so serious about all this stuff, and it defeats the purpose then, because you're all... We can't use any personal pronouns. <laughs> God forbid. Oh, wait, there is no God. Oh, you know. Relax. Enjoy the ride. <laughs> enjoy the duality. Enjoy even the, 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 like you were, you know, I understand that heartache of wanting to find God and feeling like God is always receding. But there's also a kind of fun in that. The search for the beloved. Read the Song of Songs. It's all through there. I I rose in the night and I searched for my beloved and I could find him not. And I searched through the through the alleys and through the the, the roads and and looked and then ah I saw my beloved. He's gazing through the grill. He's graz, gazing through the latticework and the joy. And it's like like my aunt said about getting into fights and then making up. You know, and it's like it's part of the journey. This cat and mouse thing, this seeking, and you know, it's it's and it's a valid part of the journey. We just it's where we are. If that's where we're at, then that's the perfect place for us to be at. And then when it's time for us to find, then we'll find. You know, it's a lot like it's a lot like fruit that that, that grows on a fruit tree. We used to have this pear tree in our backyard, and I remember the pears. You, you know, early in the season, they'd be they'd be. They'd start getting big, but they were still green. And if you got a little anxious and impatient, and you pulled a pear off the tree at that point, it was as hard as a rock. You know, you go to try to eat it, it would be like biting into a stone. It was so hard. But if you leave it on the tree and let it ripen, it'll get bigger and bigger and and gold and gold and then red little red in it and then in juicy and great and then the bees will start coming around and and then when it's good and ready plop it's ripe and it just falls off the tree and that pear is perfect at every point of the journey of the pear you know so i know what it is to be to want this believe me i know if anybody knows, I know. Because I gave my whole life to it. And then I was like doing it and doing it and doing it. And doing all these things. And it was like, when am I going to find it? Crime in Italy. You know, one of those things. And then when I was good and ready, the pear fell off the tree. And your pear will fall off your tree. Your, your, your rose will bloom when it's good and ready. And until it's good and ready, it's perfect as a bud. It's perfect Every, in every point. 
That's the thing in Buddhism, they say. Perfect at the beginning, perfect in the middle, and perfect at the end is the path of the Buddha, the Dharma of the Buddha. Is that, I don't know if that... You let me have it. <laughs> well, I wasn't trying to let you have it. Yeah, I was just saying, you know... I just, I poked at something evidently. Yeah, yeah well, it's easy when I'm in doing these things I get poked at very easily. <laughs> Not, I don't get annoyed, I just mean I get all on fire. And so I'm very responsive to things. Uh, yeah. Uh, there's a woman physician who had a stroke and wrote a book. And I oh, my stroke of insight. Yes. And what struck me was her description of realizing that, she, as she described it, she was totally in her right brain. Yeah. And she didn't want to go back to her left brain. Is this something what, I mean, like what you're talking about? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> it, it seems like when I describe or teach about right brain, it's it's the creative side, it's the side where you are more aware, where you're into your music, into your creation, uh-huh. and it seems like that touches upon an area that we, you know, maybe what you're describing all of this busyness is our left brain. Well, see, again, I'm not. I'm. 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 A, I'm a person that believes in transcendence. I don't believe in obliteration. So let's let's like be friendly with the left and the right. Brain, right? You know, we don't need to get rid of one and keep the other. You know, we don't need to like live only in the absolute and not use personal pronouns and be real weird about the way we talk and stuff. Nor do we need to just believe that all there is is sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and let's have a good party and forget about all this spiritual stuff. You know, there's a way of kind of appreciating, and that also, that's my influence, the the Buddha was a great teacher of mine for many years, and one of the things of the Buddha is the middle way, isn't it? The golden mead, the, the, like, the middle path, not going to extremes, you know? It just seems like we're always in our left brain. Yeah, so we can go to that extreme. We can always be in the left brain, but then we can go to the other extreme and always be in the right brain. And that's like with the absolute relative. You know, most people go through life completely caught up in the relative, thinking all that's real is this body, this mind, uh, getting money, getting things, being happy, having pleasures, and not having unpleasant things. And they go through life thinking that's it, and that's deluded. That's what we call a completely unenlightened, worldly person, or whatever you want to call it, you know. But then some people can get this notion of there's pure, all there is is pure consciousness, all this other stuff is completely unreal, and uh, so I'm, there's, you know, here it's seen as this. Here, da, 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 it's like, oh, for God's sake, say I, say me. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, so then people can swing way over here and be these, I, I shouldn't say this, but no, I won't say it. <laughs> I was going to say, I sometimes talk about Advaita zombies. Like, in other words, people that get so into the absolute view that they deny all humanity. And see, for me, that's my Christian mystical background, I think. Fully human, fully divine. That's what turns me on. That's what I like. That's where the juice is for me. It's like fully, fully juicy human and fully, fully juicy divine. So that everything is holy. Everything. And that's that balance, isn't it? That's that integration. That's If I had to say there's a cutting edge of my own realization, it would be how absolutely seamless is all that is and all that is appearing in this vastness, that the vastness and all that is are not separate. They're actually one reality. And, and I think that's, the, that's what we need. We need this sort of balanced, integrated, not extreme stuff, you know. Not totally left or totally right, but a little bit of both mixed together. Just like in cooking, you know, I was a cook in the monastery for a long time. And good cooking (coughs) is all about subtlety, the flavor. It's about lots of neat, interesting flavors all, like, mixing in together. If you just have something that's totally sweet, it's like, you want to go, it's too much. It's like, too sweet. 
Have you ever had something that's like too sweet? But the best desserts are desserts that have a little tart, they have a little sweet, they might even have something really counterintuitive like a like pepper or something or you know sometimes really odd things end up in desserts there's this ice cream place called Jenny's in Columbus and they have this thing called um, what's it called it's a, it's a flavor it's called salty dog caramel or something so it's like car- caramel but it's got salt crystals in it and it's got so it's got this really caramel sweet taste and then it's got this salt taste and it, it's really cool. You know, you kind of go, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> you know, and that's the way I think life is. It's just, it's got all these different tastes and and they all have their place, you know, like left and right. They, it all has its place. Heads or tails makes up a coin. If you take away the tails and you just got heads and you don't got a coin, in you, do you? You just have a weird object that somehow you cut in half or something. <laughs> Yeah. Um, you talked about how we have this diamond before us and that it's covered in layers and layers of dirt. So when you're working through those layers, what do you do with them? What do you do with the dirt? Well, I mean, ultimately the dirt doesn't isn't really completely real. It's it's like when I use that as an analogy, so it's it's layers of conditioning. So it's la- it's actually layers of just thoughts and ideas about how I should be and who I should be and you know who I think I am instead of who I actually am and you know and so we learn more and more to to, to just question those things at least you know we tell ourselves all these stories about ourselves and we believe they're all true and we think oh yeah that's who I am. I'm this person that was really hard put by, that people always persecuted, and I didn't have good parents, and I didn't have this, and, didn't. and I'm not minimizing those. Those are actual situations that can be painful, and I would never, I mean, believe me, I did pastoral work for years, so I would never, like, say that's not real. I would never tell somebody, oh, your child just died? Oh, that's illusion. That's not real. It's like, good luck getting away from there without getting punched, you know, and rightly so. <laughs> But we do learn to let go of the conditioning. We, we learn, what we learn is basically that our conditioning, the layers of conditioning that we give into and that we manifest all the time, they're looking in the wrong direction for happiness and fulfillment. All the happiness that we could ever hope for, all the love, all the meaning, all the purpose is already right here. It's who we already really are. But we have this illusion that we're going to find it in a car or a person or a, or something. And that's the mud. That, that's what the mud represents. All these ideas that are covering over the real thing, they cover it over. So we just let, let it go, and then the real thing is, shines in all its glory, just naturally. We don't have to acquire it out there anywhere. We don't have to get something new. All we need to do is take away. We don't need to add. We just need to subtract. (laughs) Does that... uh, Okay. Yeah. When um, when you transcended, when you became aware, did you you have to be broken? Many many people, many great uh, people, really, and found this... Oneness, they they were crushed. Um, Jesus, Jesus, you know, he lost the faith in his God at the end. Um, oh, experienced, you know, the worst. And, and some say that you'll never really reach that until you you lost, um, you've lost, and um, and you're completely crushed. Hmm. Well, to put it on such a bad no, that's the way it often happens. I don't know that it has to happen that way. I mean, that's the way it has often happened. The, the way of the cross, you could say. The way of... Did it to you? Sure, I had my, my things. I went through many, many years of real darkness spiritually. What they call the dark night of the soul or the dark night of the spirit. I, I, my journey was very classical in a lot of ways as a Christian kind of mystical journey. And so I, I went through things like that. Um, 
But we all have our own journey, you know. It's, and sometimes it's through suffering and pain, and sometimes it's not. It's just different for everybody. But certainly those things can bring us to trend. Because what they do is they, they, they bring us kind of kicking and screaming, you know. It's like we, we want to transcend that because it's so unpleasant. So we need to get to a deeper level. If we're suffering and we're having all this pain and, and all these things that we love and are pleasant are being taken away from us, that's generally what that amounts to. Then we have to find something deeper. Don't we? we have to find a deeper happiness. So it kind of forces us into a situation where we're under pressure that we need to find something that's going to still work for us. That this isn't working. It's being taken away. So i got to find some deeper basis for happiness. And this consciousness that I'm pointing to is itself unconditional happiness and well-being. By its very nature, it's, it is itself well-being. Perfect, unconditional, absolute well-being and happiness. So when we, when we invest our sense of wanting to find happiness in this, that, or the other thing, and this, that, or the other thing is taken away, which, by the way, will ultimately happen for anybody. I mean, that's just, that's just the name of the game, isn't it? That's human life. If we're born, we get to die. If we're healthy, we get to eventually be sick. If we're young, we get to be old eventually. It's so... And that's one of the things the Buddha saw. He went out and he saw you know, an old person, uh, what was it? A horse. sick person. Horse. A horse. Corpse. 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 Corpse, yeah, dead person. <laughs> and then an ascetic. And then an ascetic, a monk. And, so he, and he came to realize, well, all these things in life, and he was born a prince, so all these things, you know, they're, they, they just, the very nature of them is that they're ephemeral. They come and go. So I'm not going to find happiness, ultimately, in any of this. And that's basically what you're describing, that way of the cross. It's just the realization of that. And most of us have to lose things and go through that. But some people see that even before, like the Buddha, for example. He was a prince. He was young. He was healthy. He had a wife and a child and a kingdom and everything he could want. And he gave it up and went and lived as a monk because he saw before he lost those things that he was going to lose those things. He knew, okay, this is gonna, these things are not going to be here. They're going to leave eventually. So I'm not going to put all my eggs in that basket. So then he went off and he became the Buddha. Or discovered that he was the Buddha, let's say. <laughs> so, like, I, you know, I think you're right. I think for very many people and for all of us, on some level, we probably have to learn the hard way. That seems to be the way it goes, doesn't it? <laughs> but... Some people learn before they go through the hard stuff, and they just, and they'll go through the hard stuff eventually too, but if they learn beforehand, then they've already let go of it. So it's like a really famous saying is, if you die before you die, then there is no death, because you've already died. So then when death comes, it's not a big deal. Is that sort of... Yeah. You, you mentioned there were three perspectives of the mountain, and contemplative prayer was one. Or yeah. Yeah. And I'm wondering what the other two. Oh, I thought I, I didn't say, huh? Uh, contemplative practice, surrender, which is basically bringing this consciousness, like intentionally turning to this consciousness in the midst of everyday situations and experiences. Because the very nature of this consciousness, as I say, is that it's absolutely unconditionally open. To whatever comes, whatever goes, doesn't hold on, doesn't push away. And that is essentially surrender. So what you discover when you try to surrender again and again and again, just like what you discover when you try, when you intentionally direct your attention to attention, and eventually it dawns on you, oh, I am attention. I am awareness. I am this consciousness. That's who I've always been. And when you bring that intention to life situations, you eventually get, oh, my very nature is surrender. It is this vast, open, 
hearted quality to everything. It's just this unconditional openness. And then the third thing that you don't hear a lot in this scene, but I really, kind of with students, I pretty much insist on, and I tell them, you know, this is really important, and that is selfless service. To serve, like I would say, to serve Christ and others. Like Mother Teresa talked about seeing Christ in the poorest of the poor. And we all have the poorest of the poor in our lives in some way or some form. You know, so to go out and to find them and to love them and to serve them. And if we do that enough, what do we eventually see? That there are no others. That the self I'm serving in this person who needs me is the self-same self that's in me. So those are three approaches to this that can help us come into this on different levels and different situations and different, you know. So it's not all contemplative gazing at the navel in a, you know, in a cave. It's not all service and burning ourselves out helping people all the time. Nor is it all just surrender. But it's all three of those things. It's like approaching something from three different angles. So does that make sense? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's what's arisen for me. And you know what I really realized after a while? Well, that's what I did with my life. That's how I lived my life. And that's still how I... I mean, now it's not a matter of seeking something through it. It's an embodiment of that which I've come to realize. So just naturally, like when you realize you're one with everybody, you naturally reach out to the poor members of your body who are suffering. If you cut your finger, what do you do? You wash it, you put some medicine on it, you wrap it up, you go to the doctor maybe and get an antibiotic, you do what you need to do to get that finger right. And you, and you don't think that you're some altruistic, wonderful saint for doing that, do you? Oh, look how noble I am. I'm, I'm taking care of my finger. You know, it's not like that. And, it's, and, and serving, selfless service is not like that either. <coughs> you, just, you just serve because there's a need, and so that's what you do. Somebody's hungry, okay, feed them. Somebody's hurting, or somebody's sad, okay, cheer them up. You know? That, I think that's really important, because there's too much in this scene. Sorry I keep saying that. I, I'm getting sick of hearing myself say scene. But there's, there's a lot in this whole spiritual marketplace that's so focused on my experience and my enlightenment and my wisdom and my, my, my. And what is that? It, you know, it's the ego, like they say, sneaking in through the back door. And now it's a spiritual ego, so, oh, God help you. (laughs) Spiritual egos are, give me a worldly, (laughs) drug-addicted, rock-and-roll-loving, worldly ego any day of the week over a spiritual ego. Oh, my God. (laughs) And I know what I'm talking about because I've had a spiritual ego. You believe me. So, I, I, you know, I I know how completely annoying they are. And, And... and they're all over, you know, you run across them all the time, just join Facebook, and there they are. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, that's not, uh, but anybody else? Anything? Yeah? I think in your book you talk about um, if there's, um, I'm paraphrasing it, not now, but Something to the effect of if there's a sadness or a depression or, of course, that's dual, but I mean, stuff like that, that it, it can't be your real true nature because your true nature is happiness. Mm-hmm. And the only thing that could create that, the sadness or the whatever that is, unacceptable whatever, is that there's a thought that has created that. Or maybe it's those layers of mud on that diamond. Mm-hmm. But... That's mostly thought. The what's layers of mud are mostly made up of thought. What's a way to say, oh, that's that thought, and not make that thought go away? Or how do you... What's a... Well, you don't really need to make it go away. Okay. It's just like a cloud in the sky. You know, you you see a cloud in the sky, it comes, it's here for a while, and then it goes away. And any thought that arises will eventually cease. I promise you. There's no thought that comes and stays forever. Mm-hmm. So what you just get a wisdom, you get a kind of come to a sense of insight about thought itself. That, and a lot of this is about 
really a shift in our relationship to thinking. Mm. A lot of awakening, enlightenment, whatever you want to call it, a lot of it's about changing our relationship to thinking. Because most of the, the kind of one of the basic descriptions of human dysfunction is that we believe that our thoughts about reality are reality, rather than reality being reality. Hmm. You know? And most of us go through life like that. Like most of us go through life, you know, you get up in the morning and you get cut off on the freeway. And then you, 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 you stub your, you, you, if you're a woman and you got high heels on, let's say, and you lose your heel, you know, when you're going into, comes off the shoe. And then you go out to lunch with your coworker and a bird flies over and poops on you or something, you know. Something, and we go, oh, I'm having a bad day. <laughs> you know, that, 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 that thought comes, I'm having a bad day. And we believe that. We believe, oh, this is a bad day because these things happen. So therefore, it's an objectively bad... Or like um, people will... um, I heard a story about this. uh, I forget where I read this. This It's in some book or something. And they said, you're in a restaurant and um, you're saying something to the person you're eating with. And you look across the restaurant and this person's looking at you with this real sour look on their face. And you think, oh, they heard what I said and they didn't agree and now they're all blah, 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 blah. And then the person says, but really the person was thinking about how their boss yelled at him at work and they were upset. So that we do that all the time. We just, we make up life. We just, instead of just being present to life as it is, we, we tell ourselves this big dramatic story about it's either sad or happy or whatever it is. It's all, there's all kinds of different scenarios. And what this kind of stuff, this teaching is pointing to, is that thoughts are just thoughts. They're not reality. They're real thoughts. I mean, they have that. They're real as thoughts, but they're not reality as it is. They're just an interpretation of it. But that doesn't mean we need to obliterate them and get rid of them and just annihilate them and wipe them out. No, we just recognize, oh, they're just thoughts. No big deal. So then the way we experience them is different. They're not so real to us anymore. They don't shake us up so much anymore. And they actually, when an awakening to this sense of presence comes, and it's really deep and abiding, I think most people that I've talked to that I'm pretty convinced have had this, their thoughts stop actually for a while. I mean, for me anyway, they pretty much, they really practically stopped, let's say. And then they come back again, but then you realize that they're just thoughts. They're no longer reality. You know, thoughts about who I am aren't who I really am. They're just thoughts about who I am. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So, I can sense this is, it's like getting kind of late. Or when's our... Yeah, we're, we're about on time. We're about on so time. There's like one more question that somebody's burning to ask. And I'll be, I'll be around a little bit so you can... Yeah. I think I understand that, that your, your journey to what I would call a mystical apperception... And where does where is the the room for solitary and communal mm. in in the whole process? And for you personally, it, it, I'm getting the feeling that it was more solitary, which which led to a a, a greater sense of community and communalism, or whatever you want to call it. When we were all quiet with you. That's a different feeling than I have when I'm solitary in the same meditation. There was a, definitely an energy in here. Oh, sure. Can you play? Can you? Can you? Um, 
Well, again, it's a matter of balance, I think. It's like, you know, there is, I mean, I have lived a very solitary life, I, and I would never hold myself up as some kind of model for people because I lived a weird life. I mean, let's face it, I went, you know, into seminary when I was 18, I went to a monastery when I was 22, and then I, I you know, did all kinds of weird stuff. And it was a lot of it was by myself, and a lot of it was solitary, but a lot of it was solitary in community. So it was like being in community, but being silent or, you know, so I think there's a balance that's needed. It's like we all need each other on one level. And even after a person's awakened, enlightened, liberated even very deeply, there's still a human desire for human company and stuff like that. It's not, you know, that's normal. That's just a part of being human. And yet we do need times alone to meditate, to, to look within, to reflect, you know, to just be in stillness. And that's great too. And, they, and one leads back into the other. It's like, a, it's like a, an, an ebb and a flow or a warp and a woof, you know. In a, you know, one's not better than the other. They're, just, they're both appropriate at the appropriate time. To everything there is a season. And a time to everything under heaven. You know. So, does that address what you're saying or at all? <laughs> well, I, I, I think I'm Poover in the I Thou Relationship. Oh, that's a great book. And there's a consciousness and awareness, but it's relational. Yeah. Everything's relational, really, isn't it? I mean, at least appears to be. And again, you know, I have no problem with that. It's just non-duality, duality. It all has its place. <laughs> Community, solitude. It's, that's a constant tension in monasteries. <laughs> Community and so, you know, everybody's always all you know, concerned about silence and community and solitude and can we go to hermitages and how often can we go and some people are really solitude like seeking and other people are community seeking. So you got usually these different factions and, and then you got some of the rest of us that are kind of like in the middle, we like both and you know. But I think the the kind of balance in most most things in life I think you just we need a balance. We need, it's both and, not either or. And I think that's actually a sign of spiritual integration and maturity, isn't it, I think? You know, that we can see both sides of something. That we can see that there's at least two sides. Sometimes even more. And, and, that, we're, and that that's okay. That the, the more you sink into this vast awareness, the more you realize that everything is fine. Every, you know, it's not... Things don't need to be seen as a problem. They are what they are. Sometimes they seem horrible and painful and all that, but they but they are, aren't they? They're they're here. So what do I do? I respond. I do something. You know, I feed the person, or I get them out of their poverty, or I give them the tools to get themselves out of their poverty, or whatever. You know, or I do a little of both. And I, I really think that's the. That's a real sign of, of maturity and integration. That either, that both and, not either or. I say that a lot. It's always, it's both and, both and, both and. Not either or, either or. Mm. And a lot of people get into the spiritual path and they, they want it, they want either or. You know, and they get real polarized and they get in this like view. No, it's this way. It's not that way, it's this way. It's like, okay, it's this way, but it's that way too sometimes. <laughs> you know? So I think same with solitude and community. It's like a, they flow in and out of each other. And they just, they're in a dance. <laughs> in most monastic communities anyway, that's my most, mostly my experience. But they just, they're, they're in this dance and they just, you know, sometimes one partner seems...